Well, good evening, and happy Earth Day, everyone, and what a gorgeous Earth Day it is. I mean, amazing that you're all here. Uh, my name is Jeff Todd, and I am the executive director of your UBC Alumni Association and the Associate Vice President of Alumni for UBC. And it's really indeed my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's UBC Dialogue at the Vancouver Marriott as guests on the unceded Coast Salish Territory. Uh, tonight's dialogue is sponsored by TD Insurance Malash Monix and the CBC. So thank you so much for carving out some time from your busy schedule to join us tonight. Uh, show of hands, who's attending your very first dialogue this evening? Terrific. And how many of you have attended a dialogue before this evening? Great. It's about half and half. That's terrific. Um, well, it's really exciting to see such a large turnout and on a uh, Canucks game night, of all things, too. So you all are to be commended. Uh, we'll be sure to keep it all moving along so you can get to the game and catch up after, uh, after the evening is over. Uh, I'd also like to extend a really warm welcome to our cyber audience. For the very first time, we are live streaming. And uh, I invite everyone online to share your thoughts of your experience. We hope to live stream many of our conversations in the future and welcome your feedback. So this is the start of our fifth season of our provocative UBC dialogues, which have been presented locally, nationally, and internationally to our global alumni community. Uh, we invite you and your friends to participate. There'll be a Q&A following the panel discussion, and because we wish to accommodate as many of your questions as possible, please, please be courteous and extremely brief by asking an actual question as opposed to becoming a sixth member of the panel tonight. Uh, if you're shy, you can tweet us at UBC alumni. The hashtag is hashtag UBC dialogue, or you can pose your question directly to the panelists at the reception after the event. Now, this is an extraordinary time for UBC. Last year, we kicked off the most ambitious fundraising and alumni engagement campaign in Canadian university history called Start an Evolution. Our twin goals were to raise $1.5 billion for student learning, research, and community engagement in Vancouver and the Okanagan, and to involve 50,000 of our alumni in the life of the university on an annual basis by 2015. As you may know, over $1 billion has now been raised, and over, over 45,000 individual alumni were involved in UBC in the last academic year alone. Uh, thanks to you, our alumni, donors, and friends, we're two-thirds of the way towards both of our goals. Whatever issues are important to you, the ones that you grapple with or the champion in your daily lives, there's every chance that UBC is already involved. So here are some of the ways that you can get involved if you'll turn your attention to the screen. one person make a difference? I need more graduates with these skills. We are so close to a cure. I wonder what they're doing now. How am I going to manage through grad school? It feels good to share my experience. We need to preserve this for our children. How do we create a more sustainable future? I want to do something right here, right now. I want to keep on learning. I imagine a world where when I think about the if ways I was to try I and help, I don't start more than needs to I be can done. with UBC. At this very moment, UBC researchers, teachers, students, alumni, and donors are changing the world around us. So 
So the campaign for UBC includes hundreds of specific initiatives, and you, individually and together, are supporting many of them right now just by being here with us tonight. Uh, not only did we surpass our alumni engagement goal for the year, but we benefited from an unprecedented level of promotion acti and activity, from Globe and Mail ads to sophisticated online marketing, alumni engagements really being promoted like never before at UBC. And the UBC Alumni Association is also launching a new, bolder, and more engaging vision, one that reflects an understanding of alumni as an integral part of their university and of their alumni network. This new vision puts UBC and its alumni at the core of the university, with deeper and broader alumni engagement being an essential component of a globally influential UBC. So why UBC Dialogue? Uh, our alumni have consistently told us they want to hear from UBC in the communities where they live and on issues that matter to them. Our alumni want to make a positive impact in their community and around the world. And our alumni want opportunities to connect with one another and with the university. So this evening, we'll hear from alumni and community experts who are leaders in the areas of energy and the environment. And I wish to welcome and thank them for their participation. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome back tonight's moderator. We consider him to be a great friend of UBC Dialogues, a veteran journalist and broadcaster with numerous accolades, host of CBC Radio One's On the Coast. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Stephen Quinn. Stephen. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, wow, full room, look at that on a Canucks night, as we just heard. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much. I am uh, very happy to be back moderating another UBC Dialogues event. I was just asking Fred whether this was my third or fourth event. Uh, I can't quite recall because I've done them over a couple of years, but always great discussions uh, take place at these events, and uh, some of them have uh, turned into excellent CBC programming at some points. Uh, today, and happy Earth Day to everyone, by the way. Today, of course, people demonstrating, taking action to protect, to preserve the natural environment. And I am very honored to be here with all of you today uh, doing exactly the same for Earth Day. Uh, it seems very appropriate that we'll be talking about energy and the environment today, or energy versus the environment today. Um, you don't have to go very far to hear a conversation about uh, pipelines or energy or natural gas, uh, fracking, and all of those hot topics uh, in BC at the moment, especially with the election upon us. And Western Canada enjoys an abundance of energy resources, but it really has become impossible to talk about energy and, and extracting energy uh, without getting caught up in politics in this province. Uh, the risks that are associated with extracting and transporting these resources uh, are substantial. Uh, the potential rewards, however, uh, as we've heard repeatedly over the last little while, also very substantial. So uh, can you put a price on some of those risks? Can you put a price on uh, the possibility of contaminated water or, or, or oil spills? Or uh, are the jobs, are the, the tax revenues worth the cost? Uh, that is really the central question that we're going to be tackling tonight. Do you have to choose between the two? Is it energy or the environment? Or is there some way to get the best of both worlds out of it? Five experts with us this evening, an esteemed panel to say the least. Um, all of them here to address this very big question. It, it is impossible to give them all their due in the very limited time uh, I have to introduce them. So I will give each of them a brief introduction. Uh, afterward, all of them will join us on the stage and uh, we'll get started. Now, Judith Sayers received her Bachelor of Laws from UBC and is the visiting national chair in Aboriginal Economic Development at the University of Victoria. She's also an assistant professor in the faculties of law and business, and Judith is known for her work in economic development, also serves as an advisor to First Nations and to corporations on First Nations issues. Now, uh, Rashid Sumela is a professor and director of the UBC Fisheries Center and the Fisheries Economics Research Unit. He specializes in bioeconomics, marine ecosystems, uh, valuation, and the analysis of global fisheries issues. He's also studied how emerging threats to the ocean, such as climate change or oil spills, are likely to impact the economics of fisheries worldwide. Peter Layton received his MBA from UBC and is president and chief operating officer of Finavera Wind Energy. 
and Peter has more than 20 years of experience in leadership roles within the energy industry. He's currently the vice chairman of the Clean Energy Association of BC, and he sits on the board of directors at Q Resources and at the BC Provincial Health Authority Shared Services Organization. Cynthia DeBrise also received her MBA from UBC. Her entire career has been in the energy industry. And she's currently Vice President of Energy Supply and Resource Development for Fortis BC's Natural Gas and Electric Utilities. And in her role, she's responsible for the procurement of natural gas and electricity supplies to meet the requirements of uh, Fortis BC's customers, uh, of which I'm sure there are many in this room. How many for now? I guess that's all of us, isn't it? Uh, and finally, uh, Hattie Della, uh, you know, <laughs> Hattie Della Abadi. Thank you. I've only said it a million times, and we've talked on the air. Uh, Hattie is a Ca Canada Research Chair and Professor in Applied Mathematics and Global Change at UBC. Also, a faculty member with both the Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability and the Lew Institute for Global Issues at UBC. And Hattie's research has been focused on challenges at the interface of technology, energy, environment, health, and public policy. So please, if you would, uh, welcome all of our panelists up to the stage. about energy. Uh, Judas. Bit of a round. I'm here, all right. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. This, one, this one's mine. This one's yours? This one's yours. This one's mine. Okay. Yeah. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. Now we've got that all organized. Now that we have that organized, can you hear me? I am wearing a second microphone. Can anyone hear me? Soundboard. Is my microphone on? I have a loud, oh, there it is. I have a loud voice. I was, once a movie, I was once a movie theater usher, and it was my job at the Elgin Theater in Ottawa to say at the end of the film to disrupt the mood by saying, could you please leave through the front screen exits only? And to this day, there are people who hate me for that. <laughs> uh, just a few comments before we continue about the format uh, of this dialogue event. Uh, I will be asking our panelists a number of questions. Before we turn the floor over to you, the audience, uh, for a question and answer period, um, this is going to be followed by a reception in the lobby. And please do feel free to continue the conversation in the lobby uh, individually in a pleasant way with all of our panelists. Uh, <laughs> and as Jeff mentioned, um, it would be really awesome if your question contained a question. Uh, so when we do get to the Q&A part of this, um, if you, I have a reputation for being a little bit harsh about this, but if a, a question is not clearly imminent, it, if, if one has not presented itself at the edges of the radar as you continue, um, <coughs> we'll shut you down. I'm kidding, we won't really, but just please be considerate of the other people who are waiting. Uh, inevitably, we have far more questions uh, than we have time for questions, so thank you. Now, we will get started, and Judith, because you're closest to me, um, perhaps we could start with you. Uh, energy versus the environment, uh, do we have to choose, really? I think we have to choose uh, energy that is going to have minimal impact on Aboriginal rights and title, that doesn't contribute to climate change and greenhouse gases, and energy that uses our non-renewable resources wisely. Well, Rashid, your take on it. Yeah, do we have to choose? I mean, I think if, it, if you're talking about choosing in terms of one or the other, I will say no, we don't have to choose. We have to find a way to make the two work together. But if you press me and you say, should you, do you really, you have to choose one of them, I will say the environment. And why do I say that? The environment is that, and from it we take the energy. So you need that, that is the starting point. 
So you take whatever energy we take is from the environment. Just think about it, from oil, gas, whatever. And to the environment, we pump out all the things we don't like. So you need the environment as a starting point. But in practice, we need to find a way for the two to work together. Uh, Peter, your thoughts? Yeah, I, mean, I guess fundamentally, all development is bad in some way, shape, or form. Uh, you can't have the things that we want to have in modern life, though, without some development. So, so I, back to the point that we have to do the right kind of development. And I think from a clean energy, renewable energy perspective, and of course, I'm in the wind energy business, so I'm, I'm wrapping that, but we do it well because we're a relatively new industry. Only 1% of energy in British Columbia now is produced from wind. We are held to a higher standard than, than other dirt-based industries, be it mining, timber, construction. Uh, and we do it right as well by, by the first thing we do is we get into the community, we meet with First Nations, we meet with the local communities, we partner with them because we're going to be there for 25 or 30 years, longer than most marriages last. And it's important to do that right. <laughs> and I, I'd leave you with, with probably one other point, and that is just in terms of uh, resource, British Columbia is blessed with one of the best wind resources in North America. Uh, it, uh, if you draw a wind map of North America, you end up with three little dots that you want to develop, Northeast BC, Lethbridge, and Newfoundland. So, so we are blessed here. And in, in the words of one of the politicians I deal with in Ireland where we're developing a project, south of Spain is great for growing oranges. The west coast of Ireland is good for growing not much but wind. <laughs> so develop it where it makes sense, I guess is what I would say. Mm -hmm. Cynthia? Well, I, I was worried about being in a position of having to defend the natural gas industry, but now that Peter's put it out there no, that's, for that's defending... That's going to come. <laughs> so um, I think, well, the question, energy versus the environment, do we have to choose? I, and I really think it's, it's maybe not the right question and, and, and consistent with what we've already heard. It's that it's not a question really of choice, but it's a question of balance. So how do we balance our need for an energy um, to support our econo economy as well as protection of the environment? I, I think, you know, given that I come from the natural gas industry, I, I think that, you know, we can use that as an example. Um, you know, British Columbians have long benefited from the development of our natural resources. So our natural resources isn't just wind. <laughs> um, and we can continue, I believe, to benefit that and still uphold the principles of environmental protection that we all come to expect. Um, the, you know, let's use the uh, natural, the oil and gas industry in British Columbia as an example. We've had, you know, a history of safe, responsible natural gas development in this province for more than 50 years. Can we do things better? Yes, of course, you can always do things better, and that should be our, our mandate. But what, what you should know is that British Columbia has some of the most modern regulations in Canada. We have some of the most up-to-date regulations with, related to shale gas developments in the world, um, that we are the first province that has legislated um, the need to disclose the fluids that you use during some of the, in some of the hydraulic fracturing, for example. Um, the controversy around the development of natural gas and the, the improvements in the technology that has allowed natural gas to become such an abundant resource is really because of the, where it's being developed in North America, and that's in areas where there hasn't been an oil and gas industry before, and where there isn't an understanding of what the regulations are. And I think that you know, we're, we're going to learn from that as well, but that's where the controversy has come, not from how we've been developing the oil and gas industry in, in British Columbia. So yes, we can improve our practices, and water management obviously is the biggest focus around our, our development, but it can be done, and we can do it, um, and, and British Columbians can re recognize the, get the benefit from that. I think natural gas has a really important, has an important role today to play, and, and an important role in our future. Um, in, in, in BC, BC's energy future. Let's, so setting the issue of LNG exports aside, let's just talk about the use of natural gas within the province. You know, the, the one thing about the, the improvements in technology, in production technology, has meant that we've seen natural gas prices drop, commodity prices drop from almost $10 in 2008 to, to, to under $4 today. You know, for each of you that uses natural gas to heat your homes, that's a savings on your, on your, on your house, your annual housing budget of six to seven hundred dollars a year. I mean, that's that is a that's a big dent in in a lot of people's budgets. Um, 
Fortis BC has been focused on the expansion of natural gas in industries where we can make a, a difference not only for economic but for an environmental um, areas and of course that the big focus there is in the use of it in transportation and we've been very successful at pushing that out in um, in different sectors of the transportation and one of the big sectors that we're now trying to to, to um, um, adopt or to get adoption is in the marine industry which has got you know the BC ferries is a really good example LNG exports British Columbia has an enormous resource potential. You know, as a result of what's happening now, been happening with the technological advances, are, um, I know you said two minutes, but. <laughs> it actually said one minute to two minutes. Two, two minutes I know was the still, outside. I can see the sort of like, okay, you're done now. Okay, we can talk about yeah, that. You'll have plenty of opportunity, great opportunity. Sure. So yes, I think we can, we can have both. I imagine a great number of the audience <laughs> questions will be directed at you. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, and Hattie. Well, in order to allow <laughs> us to get to your questions, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was versus. Yes, OK. Very good. Thank you for that. That was brief. <laughs> Thank you. <Is> there, <laughs> did you want to say anything else before we continue? Um, if, well, I mean, the point is we were talking about just one minute, and we ended up having a sponsorship rally. Um, uh, look. Uh, Environment, nature, etc., is all around us because um, energy uh, given to us by the sun is uh, transformed into various things by life forms on Earth. That is what we describe as our environment. And any way in which we interrupt that to extract energy for ourselves influences the other things that have so carefully evolved into those niches. Doesn't that go along with our you know, campaign for raising money? So an evolution lasting four and a half billion years has allowed sun's things to create the environment that's around us and we value. And every time human beings go in there and mess about by taking some kind of energy form out, they are in fact denying the environment its due course. So it's a yes right. to that question. Thank you. Um, now on to specific questions, and I will direct the question, uh, a question at each of our panelists, but please feel free, everyone else, uh, Cynthia, to, <laughs> to weigh in uh, on, on, uh, on any of these, because I would like uh, to have a, a lively discussion. We'll do this for a little while before we get to the uh, audience questions. So Judith, first off, and this is a really broad question for you, um, how do we deal with extracting and transporting energy, and at the same time, uh, legitimately um, respect the interests of First Nations people? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a big one. You know, the, the courts have very succinctly said that the government have to consult and accommodate First Nation. It's the honor of the crown that's at stake and must be dealt with. Uh, Aboriginal rights are guaranteed under Section 35 of the Constitution, and they are not to be infringed upon unless there is a broader public interest. So the, the governments are to go to the First Nations and find out what are the interests, like what First Nations rights are going to be impacted, and find ways to make sure that impact is nominal or not at all. Uh, and what we find is that the government doesn't really do this. And so you get a lot of court cases going on. You get First Nations um, appealing through the various regulatory processes. You have First Nations that are doing blockades because they don't want to see that kind of havoc in their territory and the destruction of their way of life and their rights. And so we really need the governments to consult and accommodate properly. I'm not for a moment suggesting that First Nations, of course, uh, all speak with one voice, but is there one way? We see the example in the opposition to Enbridge where you have this patchwork of uh, First Nations that are uh, in favor of it or, or oppose it. Is there any way to uh, achieve consensus? Is there something uh, central to achieving consensus? Well, I think because the pipeline is going through so many First Nations territory, and it depends if that pipeline is, for instance, going to destroy a public, I mean, a sacred site. And that First Nation is going to oppose it vociferously. If someone else says, well, you know, it's going to go through my trap line, 
there's mm -hmm. a whole world of difference there. Mm -hmm. So it, it's hard to say, you know, do one collectively because it just depends on where the pipeline is going um, and what right it's going to affect of the First Nation. So the principle is the same right across. It's just the, what the impact is going to be locally. Yes. And what would happen if there was an oil spill and how would that, you know, impact um, the rights and the land of the people? And do governments go, in your view, far enough to addressing those concerns? No, I, I, I believe not. Uh, you know, and that's why you have so much First Nations opposition um, in the um, joint review panel. You know, First Nations have chosen not to participate in that process and want to be consulted because they feel that they, they're not being able to vocalize their concerns just in a panel. And so there, there's also different choices by First Nations about what they want to do. But, um, you know, there's great concerns um, with the amount of uh, spills that have been going on and, and how it's going to impact um, First Nations' futures, really. Anyone else care to weigh in on that? Yes, I, I, I Peter? speak to, to my experience with, with, um, with Treaty 8. Uh, I deal with five nations, and I spent a lot of time in, uh, in northern BC uh, talking with them. And I think that um, they are under a tremendous amount of development pressure from all sorts. I mean, every time someone comes in with a clear-cut plan, every time someone comes in with another uh, well that needs to be drilled, a wind farm, and if you look at the area that their uh, traditional rights encompass, and you, if you were able to map, which unfortunately the government at the moment is not able to map this with a single GIS. You can't pull up a GIS and see all of the development applications. And so that, that pressure, I think, is, is enormous. But the answer, uh, as Judas would say, of being there first, uh, and, and that's the first discussion you have to have, is, is this development going to be in an area that is OK with you, or is it an area that is, is obviously a no-go zone? And, if you don't have that discussion right away, then you're going to spend years and years of frustration for both yourself and, and the First Nations. So, so I think it's just something we all have to, to encompass as part of our development process. It's also the cumulative effects, especially up yep. in Northeastern. You've got mines, you've got um, oil pipelines, you've got all kinds of development. And adding another stress mm -hmm. to that territory you know, there's, there's going to be nothing left um, for First Nations, and I, I think that's a really big concern. So, so this, the, the discussion we're having tonight, we're talking about a discussion that obviously takes place in a lot of First Nations communities. Is it energy, the environment, our resources uh, versus somebody else, giving someone else, granting them the right to come in and extract those resources? Um, Rashid, a specific question for you, if I can, and on another topic. You recently uh, published a, res a report uh, explaining the cleanup costs and the economic loss uh, in the event of a major tanker spill off the coast of BC um, and how it could erase the gains of the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Um, how do the economic risks outweigh the gains? Yeah, you know, the way, <coughs> the way we generally deal with risk analysis and economics is to calculate probabilities. The probability, the chance of something happening, and then you try to value or estimate the cost to you if that didn't happen. And then you take what we call the expected value, which is just a product of your probability and that value. And this approach actually becomes very difficult in the sense that it can misinform. Because things that are big, that haven't happened very less, less frequently tend to be discounted by the small probability to nothing. So if you do that conventional approach, most of the time it will say, don't worry about an oil spill. It's not going to happen. It's not often. Uh, Enbridge says that there is one in 350,000 year chance of an, a big oil spill happening. If this was true, then what it says is go to sleep. Forget it. because. None of us should have heard this, right? We should have heard about an oil spill in our lifetime, right? 350. So what we did in this report is to do a very simple scenario analysis. We just said, OK, just forget about the probabilities. The question is, what happens if something were to happen? So we had three scenarios. We said, no spill, that will be beautiful. That is what we will all want, right? You have all the benefits of the pipeline and no cost. 
<laughs> pipe dream, right? Then, but we put it in there. Then the second one, we said a mild scenario, a, a middle, middle ground scenario. And actually, all these scenarios we took from a consultant report prepared on commission by Embridge. So this was the beauty of our study. We used a lot of the data from them. So we had the midpoint, and we did the calculation. If this were to happen, this will be the cost. Again, the main data came from their report, $2.4 billion will be if you have a reasonably mild report uh, spill. If you had a big spill, the calculation showed that the cost will be $9.6 billion. So, so our analysis said, if that were to happen, all the benefits will be wiped out. And I really think this is probably the way to deal with these big events, big impact things, but small chance of happening. Because the problem is when it happens, right? It's actually when it happens. That's when we face the music, right? Think of the Gulf oil spill or any of the big ones. So that was the, 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 the main point. And mm -hmm. of course, Embridge pushed back, but they couldn't push back that much hard because most of the data was their own anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, but among the people who will tell you that this is impossible, mm -hmm. uh, it's not going to happen, um, you'll get uh, rafts of information about uh, uh, individually piloted double-hulled uh, tankers uh, staying away from certain parts of the coast, avoiding the most, the most treacherous passes. You'll hear about new technology and pipelines. You'll hear about better monitoring. Uh, you'll hear about a world-class uh, response yeah, yeah. to... Uh, to it should, well, I know you don't need it because it's impossible. Yeah. But on that side, uh, I mean, there are a lot of valid points to be to be made. Does sure. none of that uh, uh, diminish um, the risk? Yeah, I think it, it, it. They 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 probably do. They do. I, I used to believe that more until the Gulf of Mexico spill came. BP said all these things and more, actually, about how prepared they are, how good they are, how the technology is. And what did happen? You remember, they couldn't even find out how to deal with the problem. So, so I, this kind of technologies can help. And the more we push, the better the technologies come. And that is good. But just remember the Gulf of Mexico. How many weeks just to find out how to deal with it? You remember. This just happened. We're all alive when it happened. So that is the thing. Balancing these new technologies and, and, and the fact that we are human and we can make mistakes. And these things are usually, like the Gulf of Mexico, very deep. And well, no matter how high tech we are, we, we are found wanting in some cases. Peter, you're not in the business of uh, moving uh, goop across vast distances. Um, but I, I'm interested to know specifically what are the environmental concerns w when it comes to wind farms beyond the, uh, the proximity issue that we hear so much about, uh, setbacks and so on? Yeah, I mean, setbacks are probably the biggest issue to start with because uh, when the business started up, it was often sold to people that, hey, would you like to have one in your backyard? And so you have a lot of what I would call um, poor development where someone's put a, a wind turbine much too close to someone's house. Uh, now, in our industry, it's a one kilometer setback. So, a one kilometer is 30 decibels. It's about the sound of me talking. Uh, there is certainly a lot of discussion of impacts on birds. Um, we spend a lot of time studying that. Um, some might say too much time studying it when you, you think of the sort of the, the biggest uh, uh, risk to birds in our, our current uh, state is uh, mirrored office buildings in downtown Vancouver, downtown Toronto. Uh, for us to do our bird surveys, we have to try and estimate how many birds might have been impacted by a turbine. You have to actually seed the area around it with dead birds to see what the kind of pickup from predators might be so that you can be sure your count's right. And guess where we get the dead birds to use to seed these from? You get them from the city of Toronto. It's the biggest source of dead birds in, uh, in Canada. So it's kind of an interesting, you know, and I think to, to the point that Rashid's making, there's a cost to this. And, and I think as a, when you're building a project like that and you've got the cost analyzed, build it into the project. Mm -hmm. Tell Enbridge, you've got to build in a $2 billion cost. Add it to your, yeah. your capital Pay cost. Put the insurance in. I mean, Enbridge shareholders would probably be happy to, to float that. 
Hattie, would you like to jump in there? Uh, yeah, I, I, first of all, I have to say I, I like Wii. Right? Um, uh, but there are a couple of aspects of Win that uh, Peter didn't uh, address. <clears throat> One is that um, you can't get Win's captured electricity to the consumer without transmission lines. And the biggest problem with wind deployment in the US has been siting of transmission lines, as Peter knows. Um, the other problem is that our climate system is, in fact, a very, very inefficient engine. I mean, think about uh, the engine in your car. It uses fuel to combust, make heat, and then move the wheels. Um, the engine of the Earth captures more heat in the equator and then moves it to the poles. That wind regime is our climate system. It is an incredibly inefficient energy system. It's about 1.5% efficient because the temperature difference between the equator and the pole is very small. When you put wind turbines in the way of that engine's workings, you extract energy. When you do that, you change climate. So much to the surprise of most people that I say this to, including David Suzuki about 15 years ago, um, a, the climate impact of a wind turbine are not negligible. The, the turbine itself creates climate change. If I was to replace all of the coal-fired electricity in North America with wind turbines, their immediate climate effect are similar. The difference is that in the case of the cold system, the system around the equator gets warm, the, around, the, around the poles gets warmer, and in the case of a wind turbine system, the system around the poles gets cooler. Evapotranspiration between the equator and the pole slows down because the winds aren't as hot, and so on. So that's why I said it's a yes, right? It is energy versus environment. If I capture the wind in order to give myself energy, I am impacting the environment. It's up to us to decide whether we like it or not, but we can have our cake and eat it too. Peter, would you like to respond? Well, I think I agree with that. I think my, my original premise was all development is bad. Yeah. You're right. I mean, we should all be living in grass huts and yep. eating lentils. We're not at the moment, and we, we, that's a societal choice. And, and I think the sort of... Uh, Yes, if we replace all the coal fire generation in the U.S. with wind. I mean, we know that's not possible. As I said, in British Columbia right now, we generate 1% of our electricity from wind. So I think it is a, it is a multi-factorial uh, solution. You need to have a little bit of everything, no doubt about that. We need to learn a little bit about it as we go. Um, and I think that's, it, it's, uh, to, to cite, you need transmission if you build wind, but of course you don't need transmission if you build a coal plant is, is again a little bit ridiculous because that means that you're happy having a coal plant in your backyard, which you probably aren't. So you're going to want to put the coal plant somewhere and transmit it. So I think all of these, all of these things are important to consider and, and I wouldn't, uh, I guess that's where I really think we need a little bit of factual discussion of the, the debate of energy versus the environment. We need to depoliticize it. Have, have we, we strayed from the world of fact here? I think we there are facts, but I think we there's a sort of, it's not a one size fits all. I'm not here saying we should be 100% wind. I'm oh, saying we should use renewable energy where it makes sense, and, uh, and we should replace energy that doesn't make sense. I didn't sense. suggest that, yeah. Peter. Okay. I just suggested that the, the, the feeling is that uh, wind one one percent at a time doesn't have a cumulative effect. In fact, every percent that we switch from a greenhouse gas source like a power station to a wind service uh, has a climate effect of its own, and it's actually quite linear. So it doesn't matter whether I replace one percent of it or 100 percent of it. If I replace a power station, I will have a climate effect, number one. Number two, coal plants are very concentrated sources of energy. So the amount of transmission line that you need in order to serve the needs that are met through one coal plant are very different to the dispersed nature of wind gathering, which is also a fact that Peter wouldn't disperse, dispute. Now, Cynthia, before you get too comfortable <laughs> <laughs> sitting I, I between the two guys on. who are duking it out over wind. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, I was going to add to the wind debate a little bit, too, I mean, from the power side. But you want to ask me a different yeah, question? Yeah, I, I do want to <laughs> get through just a couple more questions, because I do want to hand things over to the Great. audience. And I'm going to be a tiny bit late in doing that, and I apologize. It's my uh, fault. <laughs> and here's, 
here, here's what I've heard, and I just heard you repeat it, and this seems to be uh, uh, one of the lines that I hear from the natural gas industry, is that we have been doing this safely and effectively and uh, at tremendous value to British Columbia for the past 50 years, um, and, and we ought to be able to continue doing that uh, on a uh, larger scale and be able to export some of it. In that 50 years, when did hydraulic fracturing begin? Well, I, I, hydraulic as, as we know it now. <laughs> because you talk about advances yes. in, in, in extracting gas. Yes. Um, so I've been, in, I've been in the energy business for over 30 years. I, hate to, I started when I was about 10. Mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah. <laughs> and the early part of my career was in the oil and gas industry based in Calgary. I mean, we were doing hydraulic fracturing back then. I mean, it's, it's, it's really the application of hydraulic, a combination of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling together that has created, unlocked, I would say, this, this great potential of natural gas in North America, right? So in, in terms of it's the, the hydraulic fracturing is not new. Horizontal mm -hmm. drilling is not new. It's really the advancement of being able to bring those together and being able to do it from a multi-pad, you know, multi-well pad that has substantially reduced the cost of production, which has un really unlocked the potential of our natural gas resource. So it's, it's not new. What I hear from critics uh, of this, they say, you know those guys suck up whole lakes, yeah. right? And, like, so, so and then wrap them up in chemicals and stand, sand and pump them yeah. into the ground, okay. and then they move on to the next lake. Okay, so, so the lake part might be new. Yeah. But <laughs> that what it, and really what I, so you are sucking up whole <laughs> lakes. <laughs> what I'm saying, I will, the, the, we understand that in the industry. I mean, so first of all, Fortis PC is only a deliverer of natural gas. We don't develop, nat we don't actually produce natural gas. We're not a producer. Um, you know, we acquire gas from producers and deliver to our customers. I just want to make that clear. So I don't do hydraulic fracturing. Um, but certainly what we see in the potential of a natural gas industry has been these um, technological advances. And I would say that the, the biggest issue to, that we need to, to um, manage is going to be water management, absolutely. So it's being able to the use of the water, the treatment of the water after it's been used, and, what the, and, and trying to minimize the impacts of that. And do I think it can be done? Yes, I do. Right? And, and so, that's, so let's focus on not on why you shouldn't do it, but what do we need in order to be able to support the development. What is new about the application of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling together is where it's being done in North America. And, and, that's, and, and so the biggest example of that is the development of the Marcellus resource in the northeastern United States. This is an area that has not had an established oil and gas industry. This is an area that where, where they've discovered that they have this enormous resource that they can unlock with these technological advances. But, with it, but it's in, a, in a, an environment where people don't understand how the industry works. They don't understand the regulations that are in place and that, that, will, that, that the producers have to, to, to work under. And it's also being developed in areas that, we're, um, you know, that are closer to urban areas than we have developed our resource here in British Columbia. Which is, so it's, it's, that is where you see a lot of the controversy coming about is because of where it's being developed, mm -hmm. not because of, of the, its brand new technology. Rashid, something you wanted to say? Yeah, this thing, this thing you just described about where the development is going, yeah. closer to people and so on, yes. I think it's, uh, uh, it's signaling the bigger problems and issues we are facing, and that is that we're demanding a lot, not just of energy, but resources and everything more and more. And as we take out the things that are far away from people, where people live, we end up coming closer to where they live, you know, that kind of thing. So I think, given the discussion that went between Hardy and Peter, what this tells me is that we need to look deeper to start looking for solutions here. And that is to find ways to reduce our consumption of energy and all the natural resources. We just have to get down to that. And this can be there are two possible sources of consumption, is population growth and consumption per capita. So, and this goes to lifestyle changes, and, and most of us don't want to talk about that. But I think if we're going to start finding solutions, we have to dig deeper to these kinds of thinking. And, and I agree with that. I, I think that, you know, it's certainly that one of the things that the first step should be reduced consumption. Um, the next step is to the degree that you are consuming, that is making sure that you're using, that you look at the right balance of what energies that you're using and how you're meeting those requirements. You know, certainly, 
as what we see across North, North America in the natural gas distribution industry is that our use per customer has declined substantially over the last 10 years. You know, we're talking, we're talking over the last 10 years, probably 25% decline in consumption for an average residential customer. And that's because of the promotion of ener more energy, use of energy, higher, better energy efficient appliances, because of new building, building codes that mean your buildings are tighter and more, more efficient, and all, and all of those things. It's, it's, it's then, where do we go, how can we, what energies should we be used for the energy that we actually do need to do, and how can that contribute help to contribute to both economic and environmental objectives. And, and I will make that, I will direct that question to Hadi and ask you, um, where do you want to get your energy? Uh, I, want to, I want to address one point Please. that uh, Rashid raised. Um, our energy is too cheap for us to conserve it. Um, and, uh, you know, and, if you, <laughs> and if you think about it, the revolution in fracking is one of the reasons energy is too cheap. Uh, the reason for the pipelines both going west and south is because there's been no regulation of how much drilling is going on, how much, how much production comes online. And so there's a glut of production. There's a glut of production in the gas industry. There's a glut of production in the oil industry, both in the U.S. and in, and in Canada. Price of oil in the U.S. has dropped $20 in the last month and a half. It's going to drop another $20 or so because there is too much production coming online from all of this horizontal drilling. As long as energy stays cheap, the motivation for conservation remains weak. Mm -hmm. So that is our problem. Um, if, you, you know, if, I, if I'm trying to buy electricity in Germany, where wind has been very successful, or Denmark or anything else, electricity is 22, 25 cents a kilowatt hour. My bill is 8 cents a kilowatt hour here. If I was trying to buy gas, similarly, we're buying it for $4 a gigajoule here, it's $12 a gigajoule in Europe or higher. So we are blessed with lots of energy resources. We don't need to get it out of the ground all at once. <laughs> Let's keep some of this for future generations. Let, red, let the price of energy rise. Let us exercise more conservation. Now, your question. I am going to leave it at that right now. That's a good way to, that's a good way to end this little okay. discussion here. Um, and now we'll turn it over to you for some questions. And, and uh, you can direct your questions to uh, any or all of our panelists. Um, but we would like to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, we have two people here who have microphones. And if you raise your hand, one of them will approach you. And you can direct a question to the panel. And I'll let you folks right here. decide. I'll hold it. Now, what are the things that we're hearing is we want to have world-class response to uh, spills out in our coastline? And just my impression is, so I, I, this is going to be a question, I promise. I, <laughs> my impression is that the world-class response to oil spills is pretty crappy, that nobody's really very good at it anywhere. Anyway, is, is that correct, or is there anybody who's figured out how to do this? Does world-class really mean anything? I don't, you're probably the best one to answer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, me? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's nice. Who is the least crappy? <laughs> the least crappy, yeah. Actually, I mean, Jim, you're, you're right. I used, a, sorry. Yeah, I, I used to think that companies like BP will be good at this thing. Like I told you, I got really disappointed with the spill in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, when you talk of spills globally, actually, we don't hear most of them. We don't hear most of them. You have to go to places like Nigeria, and you see oil spills by big companies that are supposed to really be good at this, and it's unbelievable. Somebody says that what happened in the Gulf of Mexico happens every year, at least once, in the Gulf of Guinea, yeah. in, in West Africa. There's no CNN to, to blow it up, right? So, so I, I, I'm not too sure about uh, how good we are at this, especially the big ones when they come. Yes, Jude. Can I add that I don't think we should even have to have a world-class system. I think we have to prevent them totally. Uh, you know, we had an oil spill on the west coast of Vancouver Island. We've never recuperated from it. How do you put a cost on that? You know, like the fish and the wildlife and everything. That has never come back to the point where it was. You walk on Long Beach, you don't see anything that we used to see before that oil spill. And so I, that's, I think we have to go that far. And I think that's where First Nations are. We just have to stop until we find ways to prevent any kind of spills. Hmm. I think that, well, the 
only so. the point I was going to add in that is only that we have to, when we talk about what the small probability of an event happening and then the consequence of, of what that happening, I think that at some point, you, you know, if we, if we did that, if everything that we did in life we thought about the probability of something happening and what the consequence on it, out of it is, then you know, we would we'd all be staying in our houses. Well, maybe not. Depends on what we think the chances of our house falling down might be. But you know, there has to be, it has to be a, a balance. Mm -hmm. and, and in some cases, the balance maybe is, is too big of a risk for us to take. But let's, let's keep it in context, yeah. right? You know, the, the, the thing about the balance is about the size of the event, right? Think of house insurance. I, I suspect that everybody in this room has got house insurance, right? How many of you know one person who has ever used that in, in, in your lifetime? The probability of that happening, if you do the expected value, none of us will buy house insurance. The statistics to back it up. But we do. Why? Because when your house gets burnt, you know you are really in trouble, right? So we're willing to sacrifice and let the insurance people go rich. <laughs> we will need to sacrifice. And that's the kind of thinking you need for these kind of big events. You know, there are a number of other events where this really applies well. There is a kind of space where you can do these calculations and, and you will be fine. But when the big ones come, please. I don't think I will use that if I was the one to. Yeah. Can I ask a question oh. to the audience? <laughs> sure. I, I just want to know how many people here have taken a plane flight in the last year? And, and how many of you know where the fuel, if you took that plane out of Vancouver Airport, how many of you know where that fuel comes from? There's a pipeline that runs right under the city that takes aviation fuel, which is quite combustible, in fact, very combustible, delivers it to the airport. It's been in, in place for quite a long time. They looked for a while at barging it around, but the, the risk of a barge um, crashing off the coast of Wreck Beach on a hot summer day when Wreck Beach was flooded was deemed to be too high. So they, they put a pipeline. And that, that's been in place. And I suspect most people have no idea. So and right. it's, it's OK when it's already built. People don't have a, a problem with that. But they have a problem when, with a new risk, I guess, is what I Until I it blows up or crashes. Why, or is that? Yeah. why is it? Human nature, right? Yeah, human nature. Okay. Let me get yeah. back to the audience questions, if I can, please, because I do want to get as many as possible. Yes, go ahead. Given that, uh, as a society, we're not really prepared to price the environment at the moment, how do we level the playing field? It's, we, we see the, the negative effects of fossil fuels, and so renewables are up against it, but the carbon market here is struggling, and a carbon tax, we have one in place, but it's, it's, it's there, but not quite at the level we'd like to see to make change. And so how do we price the environment to actually make some progress on this with, without without sacrificing what we have as a society at the moment. Well, I'll add Cynthia? On. I'm sure there's lots of people that can contribute to that question, but the, the end of the question you said, how do we price the environment without sacrificing what we have? Well, that, that's the, you know, that, I guess that's why the answer to do we have to, can we choose? Do we have to choose? Probably you do, but it's the balance. So it's how much do we want to have the, um, the things that we have versus that what, what we believe is the impact that we're having on the environment. And it's, so I don't know the real answer, but. <laughs> I think the pricing singers are all wrong right now. And I think it, particularly in my industry, the electricity industry, I mean, we have, I pay less for my electricity than I pay for my cable bill. Uh, and most people here, and, and Cynthia was talking about our usage of gas per household, but I think you'll find over the last, um, 10 or 15 years, our usage of electricity per household has actually gone up. We've gotten more efficient fridges, more efficient dishwashers, more efficient washing machines, but we now have uh, big screen TVs, we have uh, digital picture frames, which are incredible energy hogs, we have all this phantom electricity usage, and, and it's $80 a month. And so we've, we've concentrated on probably protecting the people who can't pay enough for electricity rather than as a society saying, well, let's make it a very valuable good and put the right price on it, and then we'll subsidize the people who can't afford to pay in some other way. I and didn't. Without, I don't have sorry. as many channels as Peter. <laughs> uh, so, so my cable bill is quite moderate. 
Um, but uh, the answer to your question, sir, is that we need to have a higher value added economy. Uh, I came to British Columbia in 2001, and I was amazed by the blessings of this region, and also amazed at how little of the stuff we have here is processed properly before it's shipped away, right? Our, our trees are cut. We don't sell furniture, we sell lumber. We, we, you know, our, our water is drawn, but it's just taken away. Our resources in natural gas or oil is shipped off without being refined or made into petrochemical products, which are much higher valued. Denmark has almost no natural resources except some wind, and it is an economy which is benefiting its community in a, you know, sorry, supporting the, the lifestyle of its community, which is just as good as ours, if not better. And their energy consumption is about a third of ours. Their energy prices are about three times ours. But it's a value-added economy, right? And they are proud of it. We are terrible, terrible at creating value. We just extract and ship out. So I would actually point the finger at us, not at the carbon tax or anything else like that. Energy prices are indeed too low, but our economy is based on extraction rather than value added. Rashid? Yes, I, I think you touched on something which is uh, really important, and I think we'll have to find a way to deal with this. If you look at Economics 101, we have tax, taxes and we have subsidies. And, and it's in the economic model, it's in the economic principle and all that. What do you do? Society will tax things that you don't want or you want to discourage, and you subsidize things you want, right? Unfortunately, the recent debate has taken away our ability to actually tax anything or anybody. You, you try to do that. If you want to run for election, you are dead meat, right, if you do it. And I think this is really unfortunate because that's one mechanism we have. Like Peter, you're saying, if you price it well, you can tax and then get those who cannot do it to, to deal with, 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 with those at the bottom. But you can't do that. So we've actually taken a very important tool away because we don't like paying taxes. You know, so I don't know how many, like, how many of you like to pay taxes. I mean, it's, it's a tough thing, right? I yes, understand. But, but society needs that tool to be able to balance up things, to be able to price up things that we know have consequences for the larger group than the individual or, or company that is really benefiting from this. And I don't know. I just want to hold on here for a moment because I do want to get to another question. And Fred. Um, coming back to the issue of pipelines, mm. I understand there are thousands of miles of pipelines in North America and that many of them are old and are going to create substantial oil spills. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know what, quite how, how to phrase a really good question around, but it seems that we're talking about, we're complaining about putting in a relatively modern, mm. relatively safe pipeline, mm. while at the same time, we're facing the likelihood of the existing deteriorating pipelines creating ma major spills. We need the new pipelines. Mm. I guess the question is, is this a pipeline that is replacing some of yeah. those uh, old uh, derelict pipelines? Anyone take, care to take a crack at that? I'm not sure I can answer that question, but certainly, um, I'm, I mean, I am in the natural gas industry, but, but being in the energy industry, that as a pipeline operator, there is a real focus on integrity, spending money for integrity, um, uh, for system enhancements to ensure that you are always ahead of the game in terms of being able to predict what the condition of your pipe is and replace the pipe when you need it to be, before it needs to be replaced. And I would say that one, that's, you know, from a utilities perspective, that's one of the struggles that we always have is that we need to be thinking ahead in terms of what our system needs to ensure that we don't have an accident or we don't have a leak in our pipe and that we need to spend dollars to do that. And the dollars that we spend have to be recovered in your rates that we charge you for delivering gas to your home. Um, and there's always that pressure of, of, where, of wanting to ensure that you have a safe and reliable system and 
that your uh, customers not wanting you to increase your rates. I would, you know, there, that, so there is, I, and that's just from the utility business, but certainly from the, from the oil pipeline business, there is a very big focus on uh, in system integrity. The, the problem is what you hear about the, the times when accidents happen, and you can't, there's not 100% no accidents can happen, you, and you hear about those, but that is a very, very small percentage of, a very tiny percentage of the, if you look at it from in terms of how much um, product you're actually moving through the pipelines in North America. I think your point is a very important one, an interesting one. Uh, if the new pipelines are going to replace the old ones, then I think your point is quite straightforward and, and solid. So you want to improve the. The question is whether, who is responsible for these old pipes if, if they blow up? Who is responsible for that? Is it society or is it the companies that put them? Because remember, they were also new a few years back, right? And these new ones will become old. So there is a kind of problem that is evolving. So, so we need to identify what is really happening here. Are you replacing old with new, or are you creating new ones that will become old, and therefore you multiply the problem, right, with time? So, yeah. Is it a question, then, of the, the, the consequences of letting a pipeline fall into such a state of disrepair that, I, I mean, are the, the penalties don't, um, aren't enough of a deterrent? No. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and actually, that, maybe they are not. I, I don't have the data to back this. And the current pushback is probably because we're afraid of what may happen with the old ones, right? So things feed back and forth, and, and you have to entangle, disentangle tangle that to understand what is going on. Mm. Got another question, if we can, please. Mm. Hello. Um, so back to the question about oil spills and the probability, I don't really think it's a one-to-one -one correlation. Um, back to your number about 9.6 billion, Kinder Morgan, I think they're only insured for 1.3 million, billion, sorry. So there is a huge discrepancy there. So is that, is that evaluated during the decision making for twinning the pipeline? Um, as well, Environment Canada, Harper has removed basically all the emergency response personnel on the West Coast. So if we do have a huge spill, along our coast, or along our harbors, um, who would be there to help? Um, as well, there's the huge, is the taxpayers going to be responsible for to offset that account if there was a catastroph catastrophic event? I think that was three questions. Three questions. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's over and above. I have the answer to one of the questions. Yeah, All right. Ahead, Kevin Costner. Um, because right after the um, Gulf of Mexico Did you spill, say Kevin Costner? Kevin Costner, yeah. Okay. Kevin Costner came up with this, I have this invention of how to collect the oil that spills. So if there is an oil spill, Kevin Costner, I think, I think the Prime Minister will call Kevin and say, here's an opportunity for you to help British Columbia, and we'll be all fine, okay? I don't th I don't Either think that I'm... or it's water world, I don't know. I don't <laughs> think I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 this is a point we actually raise in a way. I got a, a radio uh, interview I gave after the report, and, and I was asked this question, do you mean that we shouldn't take risk? And I think that came up. And I said, oh, no, no, no. Risk is a fact of life, right? We all take risk. But when you are going to take risk, you better know what risk you are going into and what are the consequences in, and you get protection. And that is your point about insurance. So if they had taken out insurance of $9.6 billion, given my economic numbers, I, I would be more comfortable than $1, one billion because that gap, who takes it, it ends up in your pockets, you know, uh, the society, so. Mm. The problem is, is that mm. money isn't the answer. For if, if you lose your right to fish or if you lose um, an ecosystem, there's no money can replace that. And, and so I don't, so for me, insurance is meaningless until we can actually stop those things from happening. Otherwise, they're going to impact negatively on the lifestyle that we all enjoy. I, I can't 
can only agree with her because all that I've been talking is about dollars, but economics is not only about dollars. You also have to talk about the non-market values, and that's what she's alluding to. You can buy 9.6 billion, that will not return the ecosystem if it gets messed up by a spill. And that is another scale and level of looking at this. Peter, or Cynthia, anything to add? I can't, I can't be a supporter of the oil industry, so I have to agree with both of them. <laughs> Natural gas, I think, is a different beast, because it, when it spills, it has different consequences. But I, I agree with you. you know, the, the risk of walking on a 2 by 4 is one thing. The risk of walking on that 2 by 4 when it's 500 feet above the ground is a completely different thing. So you've got to look at consequences. All right. Stephen, we uh, have quite a few questions coming through on Twitter. So. Yes. Uh, here's one uh, for the panel. Aren't we focusing too much on localized risks, for example, spills, and not global risks, i.e. climate change? Mm. Mm. Anyone care to take a crack at that? Well, we talked about that already, uh, so maybe they haven't been paying attention. <laughs> um, let's start again. Wind is good, but it has consequences, even for the climate system. Gas is much better than the alternatives in the fossil world. If we're going to ship, move fossil fuels around, it's a lot better to move gas around than oil. What else did they want? Oh, uh, conservation is good. What else did we want? Higher prices are good. Future generations matter. With, res <laughs> with, with respect to your sorry? answer. Let's just, let's just get to Peter. Uh, sorry, just want to get Peter what we'd like to I'll give you a classic example of conservation. Uh, for maybe for, for some wrong-headed reasons, but regardless, we have put a billion dollars in British Columbia into a smart meter infrastructure for, our, our, for BC Hydro. So our, we now have the ability to uh, look at people's electricity use on a minute-by-minute -minute basis every day. We, for, regardless of whether you agree with that investment, the investment has been made, it's sitting there, and to, to Hadi's point, it could be the crucible for a, a whole new industry for us to take that technology, begin to learn what we're using that, that electricity for, when we're using it, create products, like actually create products in British Columbia. I mean, it'd be a fantastic thing. And we've got a government that says, no, we will never have time of use rates while we live here because time of use rates might negatively impact some people. Again, back to our discussion of taxes versus subsidies. If we if we took that money that's already in the ground, it's a billion dollars that's been spent, let's use it to create an industry, but we're not doing that. And, and to me, that could create a whole demand-side management industry. It could create a new technology boom in British Columbia. We're, I mean, we've got it there, but we're not using it. And, yeah, and I, I would agree with Peter that, the, um, that we have that technology there and that you know, it's back to the question about how do we price energy and that we're not using it to price energy mm -hmm. in ways that we can actually create efficiencies and create different ways that people use, use their energy. I think that, you know, that, that our two-tier pricing for residential customers, it, does, it, it encourages people to try to reduce it, their load um, on, a, on over a two-month period, but it doesn't encourage people to change the way they use their energy during the day when that can have a much bigger impact in terms of the resources that are needed. Uh, we have time to get to just one more question from the audience right now, and then we're going to go back to you. Um, I think part of the uh, concern of some people is that the, uh, the tendency to privatize benefits and socialize the risks. And uh, it, so um, could I ask Ms. Sayers if um, other than um, risk to coastal areas, um, if it's primarily that that uh, disturbs her, that it falls uh, disproportionately on native people, the uh, the the risk and the the benefits, and and would you be be prepared to uh, take some benefits in 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 exchange for risk? Well, I, I can't speak on behalf of all First Nations, but it definitely. <laughs> any project anywhere in a First Nations territory is going to impact on the way of life of that First Nation. And they have to decide whether or not um, it's worth taking the risk and seeking an accommodation or whether they want to block that project. So these projects have the ability to actually destroy Aboriginal rights, which will never come back. They might impact 
um, say a diamond mine in the middle of the caribou and the caribou aren't coming back. So you lose you know, your, the loss of the right for caribou or maybe moose or elk. Uh, there are impacts that they have to weigh up and decide and, and then you work with the proponent and can we do something that won't impact this way? And if there's no solutions and the government says yes, that's a huge risk, and it's you know. And if the First Nation doesn't feel comfortable with the solution being promised by the proponent and the government, then they're going to keep you know posing that, take it to court, do whatever they need to do. So every project has to be weighed up by the First Nation and what the impacts of that project is, and then they make their decision of whether or not it's worth those risks. Answer the question. Uh, thank you. I will remind you, of course, that there's a reception uh, taking place right after, and all of you will have an opportunity. Yes? Yes, One more please. question via Twitter, because yes. it was tweeted twice. Okay, I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> I, I'm keeping to your clock here. So. <laughs> so the question is, can any of the panelists discuss provincial versus federal jurisdiction regarding energy resources? Can any of the panelists discuss provincial versus federal jurisdiction when it comes to energy resources. Uh, Peter is apparently delighted <laughs> to discuss, talk about this. I, and at the risk of sounding like a, a, a Trudeauite from the early 70s, I, I do think we need a national view on energy policy. I mean, I think part of what doesn't make sense right now is we're being asked to pipe oil from Alberta across British Columbia. The royalties stay in Alberta. Do we get a piece? Uh, we've got BC Hydro sits with an 85% renewable energy base. Our neighbors next door are 85% fossil fuel. Our neighbors to the south are 50-50. Um, we, we don't have any ability to, or we don't concentrate on sharing the nation's resources across the nation in a way that makes sense. And if you look, you know, BC's renewably rich, Manitoba's renewably rich, Quebec is renewably rich. Ontario, in my industry, they're building all sorts of wind farms that should never be built because it's not windy. You know, it's not. I mean, <laughs> so I do, you know, at the risk of sounding like uh, uh, Pierre Trudeau, I think we do need a national energy program. Yeah. All right. Here, here. Good, Tim. And here, here, says Hadi. Yeah. Um, I would like to here. just uh, <laughs> thank you all for all of your insight. I, I want to ask you just one quick question, very open-ended question, uh, but, uh, before we wrap this up, and, and I'll go in backward order if I can this time. Um, what is the... Me. Bless you. <laughs> well aimed. Now there's... If we could harness that, <laughs> my friends. Bless you, Cynthia. Gesundheit. You okay? It's the, it's the hot flashes I've been having that I think we can harness that. Harness there that. We, yeah. Hattie, if we, if, <laughs> what is the one thing that you want everyone here, everyone who is, um, uh, who, who is watching this or who's monitoring Twitter tonight, Hattie, what is the one uh, idea, the one thing you would like people to get through their heads? Um, the take home, the takeaway. The person from, uh, from on Twitter turned around and said, why aren't we taking uh, global issues more seriously? Um, and I've, I've been in the climate question, science, policy issue since 1986. And anyone who asks me, so what's new in climate, I say poverty. Uh, uh, you know, we, Pearson, a whole bunch of people back in the 70s decided that we should be spending a lot of our attention on elimination of poverty. Elimination of poverty will address a lot of the things about which we worried with respect to climate change, its impacts on poorer people, and so on. We haven't done a thing about elimination of poverty that I could be proud of. So thinking about the future and the one message you want to leave behind, the energy versus environment, poverty elimination. 0.7% of GDP was pledged for overseas development aid back in the 70s. Only two countries in the world do it. Why doesn't Canada do it? That's my message for you. And I'd rather you gave that money to a pressure group to get the government to put that money into action than to give it to UBC. The, the University time. of British Columbia. That's the last time I'm going to get invited to do this. <laughs> but, but it tells you 
if you want to do a revolution or an evolution, the thing that we really need is movements towards elimination of poverty on the world. Thank you for that. Cynthia, the one take home here, the one thing you want people to remember. In less than 30 seconds, is that? <laughs> um, I, I think that, that there's a lot of misinformation around about energy and about energy extraction um, in, the, uh, in the community, in the public. And I think, I guess the one message I'd like to give is that before you decide on what your views are on what, how we extract energy and how we use energy, inform yourself, get educated, understand what the issues are. Don't react to the movie stars telling you um, things about water being able to be lit on fire. Um, understand what those issues are, get educated. All right, good point. Peter. And I, I mean, I, I have to agree with, with both. So, uh, but I, I do believe that depoliticizing the debate about energy would be hugely valuable for us all. Let's not make it a left versus right or a liberal versus NDP or versus conservative. So I think that, and then I would also say that the other thing we need to uh, do a better job of understanding is the development pressures in the areas where the energy is. So I would shoot for development corridors, much like we have wildlife corridors that we're beginning to work on in Africa. Let's concentrate our development in one spot and not try and spread it like peanut butter all over everything. <coughs> Where it's windy. <laughs> Rashid? Yeah, so well, a number of things I would like to talk about. I'm struggling to choose which one. So let's see this one. This is a completely out of here, actually, I think. I just came back from the UK, and <clears throat> if you were following, there was quite a bit of uproar about horse meat being sold as beef. As how many people have heard about that? Mm. So this is a big thing. So in, during lunch, we were having a conversation and discussing, and this thing came up. And people were saying, why will, why will the supermarkets do this? Why will anyone do this? And people are giving all sorts of answers. It's because they are ethically crazy, they are not moral, they are telling lies, and so on. And I was thinking economics, and I suddenly said, I think the problem, as I see it, is because we, including me, solidly, I'm in the center of this, we love cheap things. We love cheap stuff. We want to buy things very cheaply, right? And I think that has something to say about this house meat coming into the supermarkets. Because the supermarkets are trying every minute to try to serve us very cheaply. So we want to eat beef, but very cheaply. So you know what? You end up eating horse meat. <laughs> yeah. In the future, you eat bugs in your food because of this competition and pressure to just take things down. And I think this is related to our debate on energy and the environment. We really have to, and I don't know how we do this, but I've been thinking a lot about it. How do we say, look here, there are certain things, cheapness should not dictate that we use them. And if we can do that, I think we'll be able to balance the environment, the economy, nature, First Nations interests, and in a better way. Thank you. Thank you. Judith. I don't think we can base our total revenue, our economic future on energy in this province, as the Premier is promising on LNG. Six percent of the jobs come from the natural resource industry, six percent. And I think we really have to weigh things um, as people, citizens of British Columbia is what's important to us, and find better ways to balance them and to eliminate all of this uncertainty by actually seriously sitting down and settling with First Nations and working on some shared decision-making models and you know, really making some progress instead of, you know, if we put this energy project in your territory, we'll give you a little bit of money. That's not the answer. And I, I think we really have to be looking for better solutions and um, looking very seriously at the environment because our lives depend upon it. Future lives depend upon it. I would like to thank you all so much for your, uh, your comments this evening, your thoughts. It's really great. I feel very privileged to be up here with all of you uh, hearing all of this. I feel privileged to be in front of this audience as well. So please, for the panel, if we could.
And now we are going to thank you all, of course, for joining us this evening. We do really, very much appreciate it. We're going to hand things back over to Jeff Todd. Jeff. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. And let me just uh, add my own thanks to Stephen, our moderator, and the panel. I really appreciate uh, all of you participating in this dialogue and would invite you to join me in giving them another round of applause. I, I also understand that there were a great number of questions that actually uh, we didn't get to, uh, which is why immediately following, uh, the, following the panel discussion here, we are going to adjourn to a reception, and that will give you lots of opportunities to have more dialogue with our panelists. But uh, really, this is one of those conversations that could go on and on, and uh, this conversation actually was pod podcast, and it'll be available on the UBC alumni uh, website, uh, alumni.ubc.com. CA, and we would encourage you to take that podcast and share it with your friends and make others aware of uh, these programs. And uh, I really do encourage you to stay connected with your alma mater. Some easy ways are attending an event like this, reading, the, reading Trek magazine, or going online to learn of many alumni services and other activities that are happening. Uh, and I especially want to invite you to join us on Saturday, May 25th for Alumni Weekend. Uh, the marquee event of the day is going to be uh, CBC Funny Man and honorary UBC alumnus Rick Mercer. And you're definitely not going to want to miss his hilarious one-man show, A Nation Worth Ranting About. And if you go to the website, you can learn about how to uh, get tickets uh, for this and all the 60 other incredible activities that are happening that day. And if, you happen, if you've not made your summer vacation plans yet, we're going to invite you to join us in Kelowna. We're hosting uh, Okanagan Days from July 9th to 11th with a range of activities from golfing to wine touring to stargazing. And finally, who has their A card in the audience? How many of you have the A cards? All right. Well, if you've not signed up for your free A card, I'm going to invite you to see Ashling, who's out in the hallway, uh, who can share with you all the benefits of having an A card. Uh, our, our card really gives you access to discounts from many partners as well as a host of UBC services and venues. So be sure to get yours. And now I'd like to announce the winner of our prize drawing this evening uh, from our business card entered at registration. And I'm going to invite Simon Richards up to the podium. Simon, are you still here? Great. Pre-drawn. And uh, you now are the proud owner of your very own UBC alumni thermos. So. <laughs> so thank you again for joining us, and please join us for the reception. <laughs>